Peter, welcome. Thanks He's certainly much. enjoying Brisbane. And uh, go for it. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, Campbell, uh, your former Premier, has, has been reminding me all day, or actually from breakfast until now, uh, that I should not be pumping up the All Blacks, and, uh, and, and Lloyd got in first, and I'm not sure whether I should take that as a signal that we should have some banter tonight uh, or, or not, but uh, I'll leave the All Blacks. Yeah, look at that, the finger was raised. <laughs> See, it's the politician's finger. I thought you might be a school teacher. <laughs> uh, look, seriously though, it's wonderful to be back in Queensland. I was last here uh, four weeks ago. Or actually, uh, just a little bit up the road in Caloundra. Uh, my wife uh, uh, has a kangaroo on her passport. Uh, her father was, uh, was born here in this wonderful city. And, uh, and her mother was born in Bingen Bingenden. There we go. Uh, just, just a man from Maribara there. So uh, we have an empathy with the state, uh, and for 30 years on pretty much an annualised sort of basis, I've been uh, coming uh, through Brisbane Airport, getting the rental car, and going to Caloundra. And I said to Robin today on the phone, how long since you've been in Post Office Square? And she goes, and there was this pause on the phone. She said, um, I think Megan was three when I bought those Williams boots. And I says, oh, yeah, OK. Megan's now 22 next week. And so I says, well, you need to come back. <laughs> and, and it just reminded me of, of it's, it's a great city, uh, good people, friendly people, and, and I feel really comfortable uh, here. And I've worked with a group of, of business executives through the course of the day. And uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to address you this evening. This is where we're headed this evening. Uh, three things. Current reality uh, regarding boards. And, and look, there, there are some things here that I'm going to end up provoking, uh, and, and that's for no other reason that I think as directors and a, as executives, uh, it's on us to be talking frankly uh, and candidly about the issues of the day. If we can't do that, then what hope have our executive teams and our staff got? Culture starts at the top, the fish rots from the head, you know the story, and so our job here this evening is to have that candid conversation around the current reality, some future possibilities, and then some reflections on the practical considerations as to how we can uh, use the board as a value-creating engine to drive returns for shareholders and to drive meaningful economic development beyond the company. And we've got the panel afterwards, so we should have plenty of time for engagement after dessert. But walking through boards and the governance landscape is a little bit like walking in a minefield. We live in a rapidly changing world, we know that. How do we know? Ten years ago, this brand, the iPhone, 2006, was yet to be introduced. Interesting. Now we all rely on it, our kids. Twenty years ago, we were just being introduced to this thing on our computers where we would go www. You know what I'm talking about. So the, intro the introduction of the internet to our common consciousness was just 20 years ago. It was 1995. Things are changing rapidly. As company directors, as advisors to boards, we need to get our head around that, particularly because the next 20 years are going to be no slower than the last 20, are they? And we need to learn how to deal with that. So we're dealing in this reality uh, where there's lots going on, including mistakes. So in New Zealand, uh, and I, don't, I say this with no pride, we managed, sadly, to blow up a coal mine and kill 29 miners. 
Nobody's been held accountable yet. And the response from the government has been a fantastic health and safety uh, legislation regime, which was introduced on the 4th of, May, 4th of April, just a few weeks ago, and some other compliance-based legislation. That's good, but it's also a challenge for directors. Every time there is a massive problem, the general response is hard law. Yeah? And so that means we need to spend more time doing compliance. And so that takes our eye off the performance ball. That's a challenge for us when we sit in the boardroom. And of course, shareholders want their pound of flesh also, don't they? If boards are to be effective, they need to come to terms with these issues and others as well, and they need to learn how to respond to it. But actually, like that, did you have in Australia that, that, um, that's, that ad when they said, but there's more, and they introduced the extra steak knives? Uh, we had this in New Zealand, and they were advertising something, and the lady would come on and she'd say, oh, but there's more. There's six steak knives for free if you buy now. You know, get on the 0800 number, and away you go. Uh, so it's a little bit like this with this slide. Uh, directors that are spending more time doing compliance are sort of by definition doing less time looking forward at how the business is going to perform in the future. How are we going to divide labour between an alpha male or queen bee chief executive that wants to command and control the business and us as directors whose job it is to actually oversee and make the big decisions? How do we get that worked out? Particularly, and I see this in family businesses in New Zealand and Australia and the UK and beyond, more so also in the social sector, the third sector, the propensity to detail. You know, we've, we've, we've got directors and trust board members that have spent a whole bucket of time working as executives, working as senior managers. They come to the board table and they've got a different level of detail. So what's their natural reaction? Dive. And what does that do to our board packs? Over time, they ask for more information. And as a chief executive, what do we do? We provide it. But we don't actually remove anything. So what does that naturally do to the board pack? Makes it bigger. And then as a director, as a board member, what do we do to respond to that? We ask questions in board meetings. And sometimes we man up or woman up and say, I'm not sure that I understand this. There's a lot of challenges going on. To the point that the board becomes active and the pure signal of activity becomes the measure of how we judge ourselves. The strategic mindset is weak at best, if not absent. Real problems. Thankfully, we've got academics on our side. And um, I just want to reassure you that although I'm trying to finish a PhD and hopefully I'm going to get it across the line, uh, I'm not actually an academic. I'm a career commercial guy who, I was going to say, got talked into it, and that's probably about right, happily. Uh, but um, academics do think a little bit differently than, than us business people. And, uh, and so we've got all these popular responses, many of which emerged in the 1980s and 1990s out of America with big publicly listed corporations so that the board and the management should be quite separate and the conversation between them should be through the chairman and the chief executive, which sort of sounds good until you realise that is also a single thread and therefore a single point of failure. And in America at the time, the chairman and the chief executive was the same person, so think power, without wishing to be cynical. And independence. The ASX listing rules, as with the NZX and with others, say that you must have, what, two independent directors or two directors that satisfy technical independence. But there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that technical independence drives business performance. But people think it does. Interesting, isn't it? Dr. Robert Kay uh, and his colleague Goldspink 
uh, Colin, I think, Goldspink, Goldspink, have just done this piece of work commissioned by the AICD. You can go to their website and get it, and I recommend you do, and it's simply called Rethinking Independence. And the challenge here is, when we talk about independence, what are we actually talking about? The structural stuff? Or are we actually having a conversation about directors that are prepared to stand up, think independently, think strategically, and ask questions? Because if it's the former, I think we've got half a chance. If it's the latter, uh, sorry, if it's the latter. If it's the former, the technical independence, then we probably need to put a big question mark over what it is we're doing. In the last 30 or 40 years, the academics have also spent a lot of time looking at boards. Because they haven't been able to come inside boardrooms to understand what directors actually do, they've sat on the outside and looked at annual reports. And they've counted things, like the number of women on boards, the number of dependent or independent directors, or how big the board is. And I've put all of the statistics and I say this not cynically, I think it's good, good statistical research. Uh, they put it into the calculator and out comes a correlation that says that there's a relationship between women on boards and company performance, or, or the size of the board and company performance. And for that set of data and that calculation, it's absolutely correct. Difficulty is that a different set of data give you a different result. Because boards are socially dynamic, they're complex, and they operate in a world that is absolutely not divorced from reality. So for a bunch of inputs that go in today, board makes a decision, turn on the tap, water comes out, profit, fantastic. Board comes back, say, 60 days later, seemingly the same inputs, seemingly the same decision, turns on the tap, no water. What's gone on? Things have changed, external stuff. So it's very, very difficult and, sorry, quite unrealistic <clears throat> to say that physical attributes of boards are any way predictive of performance. There's something underneath. And that something is what directors do and how directors behave, which makes reasonable sense. But what is that? If we've got any sense of understanding what it might be, we actually need to go inside boardrooms and have a look. And I've been doing that. Uh, I talk with directors and, uh, and board members around the world. <coughs> and, uh, and shadow them, watch them, talk to them, listen to them, do these sorts of things. And generally, consistently, they tell me this. If the role of the director and the board is to drive business performance, and through the chief executive, because remember they don't do it themselves, through the chief executive to derive value, then the board's got to make decisions. Makes sense. And the biggest of those relates to strategy, and the second biggest, very closely behind, relates to the appointment of the chief executive. Decision making. Increasingly, and this is good news, increasingly boards are spending more and more time understanding strategy and spending time trying to understand where the priorities of the company should be placed in the future. That's good news. McKinsey and others do the research, they come along and they, they conduct the interviews and the surveys and, the, and they do the maths and, uh, and the trend line over the last decade has gone from about 15% of our time on strategy and 85% on rearward facing monitoring up to today about 25% of our time forward facing doing strategy or strategic related items. Sounds good. Except that, if you go into a boardroom, if you think your own boards, put a stopwatch on, and I've done it. 
What actually happens in the boardroom is that the amount of time that directors spend on strategy and forward-facing stuff is actually closer to single digits than 25%. So one of two things is happening, or potentially both. Either the people answering the surveys and the interviews have, a, have let's just say, an interesting understanding of what strategy might be, and so what they think is strategy and the person asking the question might be mismatched. And that's, that's a reasonable possibility. The other possibility is that they're puffing the answers because they've read somewhere or they understand that boards should be involved in strategy, so they provide that as an answer. And that's called human nature or protecting one's butt. And directors aren't immune from that sort of behaviour. All you've got to do is roll up the Volkswagen emissions scandal last year to look at the family. It's family business. And what happened? The board was asleep at the wheel. Same as what happened in Christchurch. Uh, and <laughs> Sorry. The, the, uh, the Christchurch City Council, like other councils in New Zealand, uh, issues building permits based on, you know, filling out some requirements. And, and if you satisfy the requirements, you can be issued a building permit, you can con construct a dwelling or, a, or an office building or, or whatever it is. And it turned out that the Christchurch City Council wasn't doing its job properly, so the central government says, no, nah, you can't issue permits anymore. Unheard of in, in the past. And the mayor was on TV, so think chairman of the board. Mayor was on TV and said, but we weren't told. Somebody's screwing up their face looking at me, and I'm going the same thing. What the... The really interesting thing, the guy's name is Bob Parker, so this is a matter of public record. I'm teaching on the Institute of Directors five-day company directors course, and we're doing day two strategy. And what I always ask straight up is, well, what is strategy? And we get the understanding going. And they had, they had a really rich conversation, and Bob Parker was there. And he was on this course. You know, he's stopping being the mayor, and he wanted to get a directorship, which is fair enough. So I had this conversation, and then I launched one in, knowing this TV piece. And I said, so what happens if something goes wrong? Is it on the board to probe and ask questions, or is it on the board to wait for the chief executive to volunteer? Bob, straight away. The board waits. It's on the chief executive. Got to trust the chief executive. So I said, really? Knowing full well what he said on TV. So what do you think, John, or whatever the guy's name was? And he offered a view, and it was like a spark. So I stood back for 20 minutes, literally, and just wandered around and listened. And The point here is this. If we're serious about being company directors, it's on us to probe and ask questions to try and understand what's going on, and that's not straightforward. So we'll talk about how we can do that effectively. If we're there to drive effective contributions in the boardroom aimed at making an influence or an impact outside the boardroom, we need to behave in certain ways and do certain things. Excuse me.